<clears throat> Which, by the way, um, for anyone attending, if you have a question, please put questions in the chat because we don't have that ability to sort of bring people on live. Otherwise, it gets a bit, uh, a bit messy because people are not prepared. Okay. All right. So um, what I'll do is I'll kick off the session right now on uh, the topic, which is how does leveraging decentralized architecture improve operational efficiencies? OK. Um, I'll leave you guys to, to introduce the session. And with this, we have uh, we have WSO2, Nadisha, who's associate solution architect, um, handling customers from many different domains and building the solutions around WSO2. Um, so we have Hoshna, and who's an integration architect at AMP. So we're going to kick this off with a. Uh, I think I think I'll let them introduce the the companies respectively and them, themselves. Uh, we're going to kick this off with a a short presentation just to set the scene, and then followed up by some questions, um, which hopefully can participate in through the live chat. And we also have some questions which were presented earlier through uh, the registration process, uh, and these will be focused on decentralized architectures. So with that in mind, I will hand the floor over to, uh, I would assume, Nadish. Yeah, uh, it has been me. Thanks, Jonathan. Right. I hope, hope uh, you can hear Welcome. me. Welcome, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, okay. it's pretty good. So I'll, I'll get things kick-started um, by going through some slide deck, uh, some slides to talk about the difference between centralized and decentralized architecture. And before that, I'd like to introduce myself. So I'm Nadisha, I'm a solutions architect from WSO2. Along with me today is Harshana, who's from AMP. Um, Harshana, do you want to give a quick intro about yourselves? Sure, um, thanks for having me here, Nadisha and uh, Jonathan. Um, so myself, uh, I'm Harshana Martin, I'm from uh, AMP Group uh, Limited. So uh, we are a company uh, situated in Sydney, Australia. So um, I'm looking after the enterprise middleware and uh, pretty much the integration team, and I'm looking after the, uh, like the architecture space of that team. Thanks, Harshana. Um, so I'll start the session by giving uh, you all a quick intro about our topic. And just to start things with, I just want to uh, set the tone by explaining the main differences between centralized and decentralized architectures. Uh, so if you look at centralized architectures, um, you would have uh, an organization that has a central platform, uh, which all the business units come and consume. So each business units have may have their own application on the central platform. They might have their own backends. They may share the uh, infrastructure. They may share services available, but it's managed centrally. So that's the core of a centralized architecture. And if you move to the other end of the spectrum, you would have a fully decentralized architecture where each business unit or business function would have their own, uh, own platform, uh, which they host and manage. And in this platform, each business unit would have their applications, their backend, their middleware technologies, their databases, and so on. And uh, the, the type of technology but, uh, which one business unit uses would, would be different uh, from one business unit to another. So uh, for example, one business unit may want to use uh, uh, API management platform, whereas another business unit may want to use uh, integration platform. So, so business units have the flexibility and the freedom to choose between what technologies to use and what components to use within their platform. So that's the main difference in a, in a decentralized architecture, uh, a decentralized architecture pattern. Um, if I move on to my next slide, so this gives you a real life uh, scenario where you might have, for example, three business units and business unit one may choose to use um, AngularJS, Node, uh, AngularJS, Node.js and PostgreSQL along with uh, WS2 as their middleware provider. You would have your second business unit, which would use drastically different technology stack, which may include uh, ReactJS, Golang, and MongoDB. And you may have your third business unit who doesn't want to have anything on-prem 
and wants to have everything on cloud. So they may choose to run everything on App Engine using PHP and use uh, cloud hosted databases for, for their database requirements. So the decentralized approach gives you the flexibility to pick and choose what technologies that suits you best and, and to utilize within, within your business unit. So some of the key benefits in going decentralized would be primarily it will provide you the flexibility and the agility. Uh, the idea is that uh, business unit has the option of choosing which technologies to use. Um, this also gives the capability for an organization's business unit to choose the best technology that fits the requirement. So, for example, you may have a business unit which is uh, which needs to do heavy integration with different types of third parties and partners. So that particular business unit may choose to use a um, low code integration technology, which may not be part of a centralized platform. So, so uh, being decentralized gives you the advantage to choose which technologies that best fits your requirement and then implement it within, within that particular platform. And at the same time, the ownership is moved from central team to a decentralized team. Uh, that's a key advantage and you would have the ability to shorten the time to market when when developing product and services when you have a decentralized platform because you have the flexibility to choose the best technology rather than what is available in a centralized platform from a empowerment point of view it also empowers innovation because now your business units can choose the latest technology the best technology available rather than sticking to legacy technologies that was that were previously in, in a centralized platform and has and it gives the ability to for a business units to adapt to uh, market requirements better and and uh, if there's a techno shift in technology platforms uh, shift in technology landscapes you have the ability to easily adapt to these changes when you have everything decentralized rather than in a centralized architecture so those are some of the key advantages by going decentralized. Having said that, there are certain challenges and pitfalls. I'll quickly run through them as well. The main challenge is uh, when you do when you go decentralized, how you are going to manage uh, the uniformity in practices that you uh, adopt within the organization. Because one business unit may want to uh, have one set of practices, while the other business unit may have its own set of practices. So basically, you have loss of control in terms of how you manage your IT infrastructure. Uh, there's definitely duplication of effort because uh, there will be multiple teams now managing different platforms in each business unit. And at the same time, there will also be um, uh, additional resources used, duplication of resources used because each business unit would have its own servers, have its own software that also adds up to the resource consumption. Uh, there's also challenges in enablement and knowledge transfer because you need to have a way of uh, transferring knowledge about technology to different business units. So it, it's, it's a challenging process. And uh, you don't have centralized governance now because everything is decentralized and security also becomes a concern when you go uh, with this kind of approach. So these are the challenges and pitfalls. Um, uh, Jonathan, if there's any questions, we can answer them now. Uh, I, I saw there are a few questions about uh, uh, how AMPA actually does decentralization and, and some questions relating to uh, how operational efficiency plays a, uh, 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 the advantage you can get from an operational efficiency standpoint as well. Okay, so you're taking those questions from the Google Sheet? Yes, shall I? Uh, so there was a question on uh, on uh, how decentralized architectures work and how it will result in operational efficiencies. Okay. So, um, so I'll 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 also answer the same the same question. So from a uh, from a uh, operational efficiency standpoint, the main advantage is flexibility uh, and agility. Uh, this particular architecture brings in. It allows you to, um, you know, innovate and build a platform uh, using the latest or the the most suitable technology for that particular requirement. So that's one of the key drivers of operational efficiency. 
uh, and it also allows you to leverage on the strengths of the team. So you may have, for example, a team who's very familiar with the uh, latest technologies like uh, uh, Golang or, or Node.js rather than legacy programming languages. So you have the ability to leverage on that and, um, and, uh, and uh, choose technologies that best fits your team structure and the team that you have. Um, and since you have better control on, on what you're building, uh, you don't have to carry the technical debt that would come with a centralized platform. So all these adds up to, to high levels of operational efficiency when running platforms on a decentralized architecture. Um, sure. sure. So, I mean, um, w w in, in terms of AMP, uh, be kind of interesting to to know how how you've leveraged all this, right? I mean, I think the theory is is good, right? Uh, but to, to actually learn how how has it been done, right? Like uh, leveraging decentralized architectures and 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 especially the benefits. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, yeah. Jonathan. Um, so uh, if you look at uh, AMP, so we are a Quite a big organization in terms of the number of uh, people we have like uh, around thousand people in our it itself because uh, the way that uh, our uh, like our organization is actually structured is actually just suits nicely for the the decentralized architecture because what we have is like a quite a lot of business units for example if i name a few we have mp bank which is specialized in the bank sector um then we have mp wealth which is looking after superannuation uh, and the investment uh, related to supervision. So similar to that, then we, we have like quite a lot of uh, technology teams within these uh, individual uh, portfolios or individual business units. So if you look at it, uh, what we have is actually uh, pretty much that uh, structure, which is really good for the, uh, the decentralized architecture because individual teams, they use a different tech set of technologies. Uh, for example, bank use set of technologies, which is different from uh, the, the technologies that used for the wealth because the business itself is quite different. So you can't really say one set of technologies is good or matters for the next. So we have actually done exactly what Nadisha mentioned because we use different set of technologies for different set of uh, use cases, different set of uh, business units. So that's how what we have done there. And in terms of uh, uh, the structure, we have uh, like a group technologies, which is the team that I'm representing. So the group technologies provide a set of uh, capabilities which is common across the board. For example, uh, we have integration. So integration is a capability that's required for all these business units. So my team, for example, we provide that capability across the board for all the business units to use. So if a team requires to use a, a set of uh, APIs, they want to expose a set of APIs to one of our customers, to our partners, um, they actually come to us and then we provide that capability to them we provide the platform for them to actually go and build it. Um, so the, the example, one of the examples that you are looking at right now in the screen is like one of the latest examples that we had. So all these uh, like dotted lines are different business units coming together to formulate the one solution. So the solution at the end of the day is actually open banking solution. But you can't, you can't really see how many different business units actually working together to formulate that one solution. For example, we have my team participating to provide the, the API gateway capability and then the data holder capability. And we are actually working with uh, multiple teams. For example, we are working with Bank, who's providing the, the backend uh, domain APIs. And then we have the customer team who's providing the basic information about the customer. And uh, of course, uh, we actually uh, secure the API using our uh, API security or our IAM team, who's a different portfolio. And then we have our digital team who's looking after the digital aspect, the digital channels, as well as the CRM aspect. So one solution, but many different business units with different technologies coming together and then implementing that solution. And yeah. uh, it I want- makes it, look, makes it look very clear, just uh, interrupt on who, who the users are. Would they be internal banking users? Would they be external partners? Would they be customers? No. Yeah, so uh, the open banking solution, for example, if I take that example alone, it's actually our banking customers, which is the actual real world customers coming together to uh, do this uh, implementation. Because uh, they actually, with this particular implementation, they can share the, the details about their uh, banking 
uh, like uh, how many bank accounts they have, what's the balances, what's the different uh, uh, direct debit uh, associations they have, all this information with the different partners they have. So it's their information, they actually opt in to share that information. So this example that you are looking at is actually one of the external use cases, but it's not limited to the external use cases because I will get to that point in the next one. Uh, but before that one, I want to touch base on a couple of uh, like benefits we have from this uh, as a decentralization. So the first one is actually the scalability, because now it's like quite a lot of business units uh, using all these uh, different set of technologies. We can actually scale up and implement quite a lot of uh, uh, different initiatives at the same time. So think about one team trying to implement five different projects versus you have five different teams who can scale up and uh, working on different technologies, different to deliver different parts of individual technologies, which is more scalable. So that's one of the things. And the second one is actually the less time to market because we actually like as different business units coming together to deliver like a deliver different pieces, you can actually uh, go with uh, your own pace. So for example, when uh, we are doing our development, we don't have to wait until um, everything to be delivered by the digital team because we kind of uh, running our own autonomous process. So we share that information, we come up with the, the design. Uh, after that point, we just run our own pace. And then we have the independent delivery cycles, which is again related to the same thing. And uh, we have the flexibility to plan and execution because uh, we like, again, as I mentioned, it's all autonomous uh, set of cycles running within different business units. We run off our own uh, cycles. And then the, the technology choices for individual use cases, for example, like uh, our digital team uses the like front end technologies, which is totally different from the technologies that bank uses, which is again different from the technologies that we uses. Wow, make it you make it sound easy. How how how? how I mean, the, so the question that came in is um, based on your experience. At what point in time should an organization break its centralized architecture to small, manageable, decentralized components? So it's kind of like a as an assumption that things are fully centralized and need to be broken not sure what that meant but uh, at least segregated um how, yeah. how, did, how, how did it happen um for us it was it was sort of a natural uh, growth uh, jonathan i would say or a natural evolution of that uh, particular uh, journey that we have for example, um, right now, uh, what we have is like a one team providing all the API capability for the organization. So uh, for example, if our one business uh, domain team want to expose uh, uh, API for one of our internal team, they actually come to us and then we have to get in all in their process to uh, go ahead and then uh, enable it. But the problem is like, now imagine um, there are four or five different uh, such business units coming to us and then asking us to do the work at the same time. So we have to actually allocate people to do that from my team to uh, to go to different, these different teams and then working together. So that's actually going to not, that's not only like we have to allocate people to those uh, different initiatives, but uh, that's actually hindering the, the progress, that's actually hindering the 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 pace that these different in individual initiatives are going through. So uh, that's where we actually thought and said like, okay, so having one integration team, for example, might not be the best choice in terms of the scalability. So the, the next best thing what we can do is like give that uh, capability as a platform to everyone to use. So for example, you're looking at the integration uh, platform as a service or iPaaS. So what we are trying, like what we are implementing right now within AMP is actually iPaaS platform. Uh, we are providing the integration services or integration capabilities to individual business units. So they can actually uh, do their deployment. They can decide when to do their release cycle. If they have a, a new version of uh, existing API, they can just go ahead and do it by themselves. What we provide as the, from my team is actually a central control plane which actually provide that, uh, like the common set of capabilities. For example, we provide security, we provide the, the tracing capability, we provide end-to-end -end logging and uh, so the, the different aspects of that, including we actually provide that uh, the, the, the guardrails for people to carry on and use the best practices. Because for years, 
my team used to do this task, right? So we have like quite a lot of experience doing it. We are, we know we had to like uh, what to avoid in this aspect. So what we do is like we have to create a lot of automation so the teams can take these automation uh, tools and they can run this process by themselves and deploy it by themselves. So we provide the platform, they do it, everyone is happy, it's much faster cycles. So auto automation, what's in testing? Uh, or which, which sort of automation? Um, the, the level of automation we are providing as it actually go uh, varies from different aspects. So we provide automation to create the, the different set of APIs. We provide automation to actually run through the uh, different uh, code reviews. We provide automation to run through the build process, the, then the creating the, the images, the deploying the images, as well as the versioning. So all these uh, steps are actually all automated. So that's what uh, we are doing right now. Wow, okay. Uh, let's uh, put it to the uh, audience, right? I've got a range of people here. I won't call out everyone individually. Uh, as architects, some VP solution engineers. I uh, just wondered if, you've, if, if anyone's gone through this, have got any sort of anything to share uh, themselves, pitfalls, successes. All right, so yeah, I invite you to put that in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, oh, so <laughs> see, yeah. So from AMP, yeah. Why not kick it off? Yeah. So I was just uh, thinking of doing the ex exact same thing because uh, because we have gone through the journey. I can give a couple of things. Uh, where we had to be careful, where we had to be like uh, to focus on. Um, so the first one I would say having the right governance structure, because uh, you now like as one team uh, used to do all these tasks. Uh, you as one team actually tried to do all this development, and then uh, like all the teams are coming to you and do that one. But now we are thinking of uh, having a whole distributed setup. You have to have the right set of governance structure, like. Uh, we have to have uh, right uh, architecture working groups. We have to have architecture uh, across the board to say, yes, that's how we should be doing or how we should be approaching this particular problem or no, we have uh, to actually make a change to that uh, problem. So having that uh, governance structures, that's very important. Uh, the second one is actually the standardization of the old and the quality control. So for that one, what we did in our end is actually we set up an API working group uh, with participation from all the business units. So we have people come from all the business units who is doing the API development, for example, and we set up a common set of uh, standards to say, this is how we are going to name our APIs. This is how we are going to version our API. This is how we are going to uh, name our resources. This is how we are going to use our different uh, resource uh, verbs. So all these things we have documented and we have agreed on, we have uh, discussed. So that's one of the things that we did. The third one was, I would say, uh, pretty much the automation. So the idea of automation is uh, to uh, enable the standardization, plus it's actually making people to make uh, mistakes harder. Because when you have automation, you actually get let the automation to follow the, the journey, and you only initiate the automation step. And that way, you don't do a lot of manual things, which means automatically you reduce the chance of someone making a mistake. So I would say that's one of the, the things that, uh, like the, that's like the three major things that we have considered in our okay. space. Thanks for sharing, uh, it's great. Uh, I saw Nadisha nodding his head uh, in agreement. Uh, yes. uh, well, I was wondering how would WS, WS2 f fit into this? I mean, is there anything specific that uh, was um, used? Yes, so the from a product design point of view to uh, run times uh, have been thought through to work in a decentralized architecture from a product standpoint. So that's that's a key advantage, and that's that, that's a, that's a feedback that we've got from a lot of our customers as well. Um, so Harshana, uh, I'm just uh, just to uh, bounce back with Harshana. Uh, Harshana, how is your experience in working with WS2 products in in achieving this decentralization? practices that you want to achieve within AMP Bank? Um, I would say like uh, my experience and uh, I would say even my uh, team's experience with WC2 has been really great um, using the WC2 products for this particular purpose. Um, the reason being um, the, the technology front, uh, what we are actually using is uh, 
if I name the, the products exactly, it's actually uh, we are using WS2 API micro gateway mm -hmm. and uh, we are using WS2 micro integrator. So that's like the, that's the two main products that we use from WS2. Okay. So uh, micro gateway and micro integrator both are based on containers. So the, that allowed us to uh, run all these capabilities and provide these capabilities to run at scale. And uh, what we do is like to provide the control plane that makes our like deployment structures, the, our deployment strategy much easier because we uh, we use uh, one of the cloud providers. So, and we set up the central control plane in our, my account or our account, for example. And then we actually go and uh, let the people to deploy these containers on their account. And then the, the containers from their account communicate with the, the central control plane which captures that the security aspect, the logging aspect, tracing, all that uh, observability, all of those provided by uh, one central platform. So everyone can, everyone can do it. So that enabled like the whole containerization allowed the whole thing to work really nicely. But imagine if you had to do that one using uh, some sort of uh, like a monolithic art structure, it's going to be really difficult to do that one. And it's going to be like from the cost perspective, it's not going to add up. So the containerization uh, technologies made that possible. And especially coming from the WS2, we, we use that uh, all those capabilities uh, coming from the, the platform. And the other thing is like, uh, rather than actually using uh, like some sort of uh, ground, uh, like uh, Java or some other uh, language that uh, uh, some sort of a language, like a regular uh, language, we could do the integration uh, uh, capabilities using that. But the problem is, then you have to build all the, uh, the the building blocks from the scratch. You have to build what is the endpoint. You have to build all the the different uh, uh, different set of uh, like enterprise integration patterns, because these are not uh, first class citizen of that uh, language, right? So we have to build that one from uh, ground, or we can actually use the integration uh, platform. So that's where the the WS2 added another layer because WS2 act as a integration platform. Not only can support all these decentralization. It actually gives us that first class citizenship for all these different constructs in the integration space. So those two things combined actually made it possible for us to use it. Great, great to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear the specifics of how it was done. Um, I would imagine you have a staging environment so that when you deployed it to the uh, consumers of the services, they could they could decide how they were going to release the whole their their, their services to the consumers. Yes, Jonathan. So uh, in terms of the number of environments, we actually have seven environments. So it goes through quite a lot of uh, rigorous testing before it goes to production. For example, we have multiple dev environments. Like uh, to be precise, like we have two dev dev, dev environments to yes. go in parallel developments. And then uh, we have two different uh, parallel uh, like a promotion cycles. So for example, we have a uh, system test environment. Um, then we, we actually take that uh, particular code into the use acceptance, acceptance test environment. So nothing goes without uh, going through at least two different set of cycles. So uh, you have a set of technical users who's doing the validation within the system test environment, which is then passing on to the business users to say, uh, please check whether the, the business uh, function is actually uh, like working as expected before it goes to production. So it goes through two different cycles, uh, but even before entering this particular like system test environment, it has to go through all the developer testing itself. So we have the unit testing as well as the integration testing. So everything goes through this uh, different set of cycles. Cool, cool. That's for the iPads. So when it came to AMP Wealth and AMP Bank domain, they, they would have their own processes, I would assume. Yes. So um, the like pretty much all our like different business units, they have uh, similar environments, at least two different environments, because what we have is like, we have end-to-end -end testing cycles. For example, if you consider the system test, um, like pretty much all the business units have one environment dedicated for the business, uh, sorry, system test. Similarly, they have a dedicated environment from all the business units for the uh, unit test or the uh, user acceptance testing. So, when someone actually say like, I want to actually test this feature or business uh, functionality within the UAT environments, that means it's end to end, all the business units participating in that initiative will actually deploy their code into that respective environment and then asking the business uh, users to test there. So uh, like downstream, there might 
be different number of environments for individual things, but in terms of the non-production uh, or staging environments, it's a similar number for all the teams. Well, thanks for clarifying. We're at the uh, the end of the session, believe it or not. Okay. Already 30 minutes. Has it, has it gone quickly? It, yeah, it has <laughs> gone. So, so a great opportunity for uh, participants to, to just chill out, ask some questions, have a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> I think we'll be here for the next, few, if it's okay with you guys, next five minutes or so. Um, so is there, is there anything else that anyone would like to talk about from a presenter point of view? Well, how, can you be, how can you be reached, for example, if people come up with questions later? Um, I mean, both of us, I mean, um, speaking for Harshan as well, I think you, you, could, you could directly email both of us if, if that's uh, one way of reaching, that's one possible way of reaching to us and both of us are on LinkedIn as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Stop a message, we will be more than happy to help you out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So look, I hope everyone's uh, got a lot more in insight. We've gone through a journey of decentralized architectures and we looked at the benefits and then practically how it was implemented and some of the pitfalls. I think pretty much a lot covered in the last 30 minutes. So uh, all, all there is to, to do is uh, thank everyone who's joined the session, about 15 people here, and um, also the presenters from different, different time zones uh, and very much appreciate you uh, taking the time to prepare the content. I know there's a lot of things to talk about. So look, unless there's anything else, what I'm going to do is I'll just close, close the session now so people can get on with their day. Thank everyone. And uh, we'll leave the chat open just in case you have any further questions. OK, so thanks, Thank guys. You, Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Harrison. All right. Thank thanks, everyone else. OK. Thanks, everyone, joining. Thank, Thank you. Bye.